Audio Papers presents Section 2 The Causal Fundamentalist's Dilemma The Dispensability of Causes Russell, in 1917, got it right in his much celebrated Repost. Quote, All philosophers of every school imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms or postulates of science. Yet, oddly enough, in advanced sciences such as gravitational astronomy, the word cause never occurs. The law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving like the monarchy, only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. Unquote. When they need to be precise, fundamental sciences do not talk of causes, but of gravitational forces, or voltages, or temperature differences, or electrochemical potentials, or a myriad of other carefully devised central terms. Nonetheless, they are still supposed to be all about causes. Perhaps the analogy is to an account of a bank robbery. It can be described in the most minute detail. The picking of the lock, the begging of the cash, without ever actually mentioning theft or robbery. If one thinks cause might have a similar surreptitious role in science, it is sobering to compare the cases of causation with that of energy. Many sciences deal with a common entity, energy, which manifests itself quite directly throughout the science. Sometimes it appears by name, kinetic energy, potential energy, field energy, elastic energy, and other times it appears as a synonym, heat, work, or the Hamiltonian. However, there is little doubt that each of the sciences is dealing with the very same thing. In each science, the energies can be measured on the same scale. So many joules, for example, and there are innumerable processes that convert the energy of one science into the energy of another, affirming that it is all the same stuff. The term is not decorative, it is central to each theory. Causal Fundamentalism If one believes that the notions of cause and effect serve more than a decorative function in science, one must find some manifest basis for their importance. It is clearly too severe to demand that causes all be measurable on some common scale, like energies. We can afford to be a little more forgiving. However, we must find some basis. Taking cash is theft because of an identifiable body of criminal law. What should that basis be in the case of causes? In it, the notion of cause must betoken some factual property of natural processes. Otherwise, its use is no more than an exercise in labeling. And the notion must be the same or similar in the various sciences. Otherwise, the use of the same term in many places would be no more than a pun. I believe this basis to be broadly accepted and to energize much of the philosophical literature on causation. I shall call it causal fundamentalism, colon. Nature is governed by cause and effect, and the burden of individual sciences is to find the particular expressions of the general notion in the realm of their specialized subject matter, period. My goal in this section is to refute this view. In brief, I regard causal fundamentalism as a kind of a priori science that tries to legislate in advance how the world must be. These efforts have failed so far. Our present theories have proven hard enough to find, and their content is quite surprising. They have not obliged us by conforming to causal stereotypes that were set out in advance and there is little reason to expect present causal stereotypes to fare any better. The difficulty for causal fundamentalism is made precise in Causal Fundamentalist's Dilemma, colon, 
Either conforming a science to cause an effect places a restriction on the factual content of a science, or it does not. In either case, we face problems that defeat the notion of cause as fundamental to science. In the first horn, we must find some restriction on factual content that can be properly applied to all sciences, but no appropriate restriction is forthcoming. In the second horn, since the imposition of the causal framework makes no difference to the factual content of the sciences, it is revealed as an empty honorific. Period. The first horn. Discerning how causation restricts the possibilities has been the subject of a long tradition of accounts of the nature of cause and effect, and of the law or principle of causality. One clear lesson is learned from the history of these traditions. Any substantial restriction that they try to place on a science eventually fails. There is no shortage of candidates for the factual restriction of the first horn. The trouble is, none work. Let us take a brief tour. Aristotle described four notions of cause. The material, efficient, final, and formal. With the efficient and final conforming most closely to the sorts of things we would now count as a cause. The final cause, the goal towards which a process moves, was clearly modeled on the analogy between animate processes and the process of interest. In the 17th century, with the rise of the mechanical philosophy, it was deemed that final causes simply did not have the fundamental status of efficient causes, and that all science was to be reconstructed using efficient causes alone. Although talk of final causes lingers on, this is a blow from which final causes have never properly recovered. The efficient cause, the agent that brings about the process, provided its share of befuddlement. Newton, in 1692, pulled no punches in his denunciation of gravity as causal action at a distance. Quote, that one body may act upon another at a distance through a vacuum, without the mediation of anything else, by and through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another, is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man who has in philosophical matters a competent faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Gravity must be caused by an agent acting constantly according to certain laws." Unquote. Causes cannot act where they are not. Nonetheless, several centuries of failed attempts to find a mechanism or even finite speed for the propagation of gravity brought a grudging acceptance in the 19th century that this particular cause could indeed act where it was not. In the same century, causes were pressed to the forefront as science came to be characterized as the systematic search for causes, as in Mill's System of Logic. At the same time, an enlightened skeptical view sought to strip the notion of causation of its unnecessary metaphysical and scholastic decorations. While it might be customary to distinguish in causal processes between agent and patient, that which acts and that which is acted upon, Mill urged that the distinction is merely a convenience. Or, he urged, the continued existence of the cause is not needed after all for the persistence of the effect. All that remained was the notion that the cause is simply the unconditional invariant antecedent. Quote, for every event there exists some combination of objects or events, some given concurrence of circumstances, positive and negative, the occurrence of which is always followed by that phenomenon." Unquote. Causation had been reduced to determinism. Fix the present condition sufficiently expansively, and the future course is thereby fixed. Thus, the 19th century brought us the enduring image of Laplace's famous calculating intelligence who could compute the entire past and future history of the universe 
from the forces prevailing and the present state of things. This great feat was derived directly from the notion that cause implied determinism, as the opening sentence of Laplace's 1825 passage avows. Quote, we ought then to consider the present state of the universe as the effect of its previous state, and the cause of that which is to follow." Unquote. This lean and purified notion of causation was ripe for catastrophe, for it inherited just one fragile notion, determinism. The advent of modern quantum theory in the 1920s brought its downfall. For in the standard approach, the best quantum theory could often deliver were probabilities for future occurrences. The most complete specification for the state of the universe now cannot determine whether some particular radium-221 atom will decay over the next 30 seconds, its half-life. The best we can say is that there is a chance of one half of decay. A lament for the loss of the law of causality became a fixture in modern physics texts. While the refutation seemed complete, causation survived weakly. If causes could not compel their effects, then at least they might raise the probabilities. A new notion of causation was born, probabilistic causation. Quote, this quantum indeterminacy is, in fact, the most compelling reason for insisting upon the need for probabilistic causation. Unquote. Salmon, 1980, page 73. One could be excused for hoping that this enfeebled notion of probabilistic causation might just be weak enough to conform peacefully with our physics. But the much neglected fact is that it never was. All our standard physical theories exhibit one or another form of indeterminism. That means that we can always find circumstances in which the full specification of the present fails to fix the future. In failing to fix the future, the theories do not restrict the range of possibilities probabilistically, designating some as more likely than others. They offer no probabilities at all. This failure of determinism is a commonplace for general relativity that derives directly from its complicated space-time geometries, in which different parts of space-time may be thoroughly isolated from others. For determinism to succeed, it must be possible to select a spatial slice of space-time that can function as the now, and is sufficiently well connected with all future times, that all future processes are already manifest in some trace form on it. Very commonly, space-times of general relativity do not admit such spatial slices. What is less well known is that indeterminism can arise in ordinary Newtonian physics. Sometimes it arises in exotic ways, with quote-unquote space invaders, materializing with unbounded speed from infinity and with no trace in earlier times. Or it may arise in the interactions of infinitely many masses. In other cases, it arises in such prosaic circumstances that one wonders how it could be overlooked and the myth of determinism in classical physics sustained. A simple example is described in the next section. With this catalog of failure, it surely requires a little more than naive optimism to hope that we still might find some contingent principle of causality that can be demanded of all future sciences. In this regard, the most promising of all present views of causation is the process view of Dao, Salmon, and others. In identifying a causal process as one that transmits a conserved quantity through a continuous spatiotemporal pathway, it seeks to answer most responsibly to the content of our mature sciences. Insofar as the theory merely seeks to identify which processes in present science ought to be labeled as causal, and which are not. It succeeds better than any other account I know. If, however, it is intended to provide a factual basis for a universal principle of causality, then it is an attempt at a priori science, made all the more fragile 
by its strong content. If the world is causal according to its strictures, then it must rule out a priori the possibility of action at a distance, in contradiction with the standard view of gravitation in science in the 19th century. Similar problems arise in the selection of the conserved quantity. If we restrict the conserved quantity to a few favored ones, such as energy and momentum, we risk refutation by developments in theory. Certain Newtonian systems are already known to violate energy and momentum conservation, and in general relativity, we often cannot define the energy and momentum of an extended system. But if we are permissive in selection of the conserved quantity, we risk trivialization by the construction of artificial conserved quantities specially tailored to make any chosen process come out as causal. Or do we ask too much in seeking a single universal principle? Perhaps we should not seek a universal principle, but just one that holds in some subdomain of science that is fenced off from the pathologically acausal parts of science. The first problem with this proposal is that we do not know where to put the fence. The common wisdom has been that the fence should lie between the pathologically acausal quantum theory and the causally well-behaved classical physics. Yet some dispute whether quantum theory has shrunk the domain in which the causal principle holds. And the example of the next section shows that even the simplest classical physics still admits acausal pathologies. The second problem is, if we did find where to put the fence, what confidence can we have of finding a single principle that applies in the causal domain? The proliferation of different accounts of causation and the flourishing literature of counterexamples suggests no general agreement even on what it means to say that something is a cause. So perhaps we should also give up the search for a single principle and allow each causally well-behaved science to come up with its own distinct principle of causality. Or we may purchase broad scope by formulating a principle so impoverished that it no longer resembles causation, but contradicts no present science. Marginau proposes that causality is the, quote, temporal invariability of laws. Causality holds if the laws of nature, differential equations, governing closed systems do not contain the time variable in explicit form, unquote. Now, the real danger is that we eviscerate the notion of causation of any factual content. For now, we can go to each science and find some comfortable sense in which it satisfies its own principle of causality, since, with only a little creativity, that can be done with essentially any science, real or imagined. The demand of conformity to cause and effect places no restriction on factual content and we have left the realm of the first horn. The second horn. Let us presume that conforming a science to cause and effect places no restriction on the factual content of the science. The immediate outcome is that any candidate of science, no matter how odd, may be conformed to cause and effect. The notion of causation is sufficiently plastic to conform to whatever science may arise. Causal talk now amounts to little more than an earnest hymn of praise to some imaginary idol. It gives great comfort to the believers, but it calls up no forces or powers. Or is this just too quick and too clever? Even if there is no factual principle of causality in science to underwrite it, might not the concept of cause be somehow indispensable to our science? Perhaps the most familiar and longest-lived version of this idea is drawn from the Kantian tradition. It asserts that we must supply a conception of causation if we are to organize our experiences into intelligible coherence. A variant of this is Nagel's proposal that the principle of causality, even in vague formulation, quote, is an analytic consequence of what is commonly meant by theoretical science. 
It is difficult to understand how it would be possible for modern theoretical science to surrender the general ideal expressed by the principle without becoming thereby transformed into something incomparably different from what that enterprise actually is. Unquote. Nagel formulates the principle as a methodological rule of heuristic value, which, quote, bids us to analyze physical processes in such a way that their evolution can be shown to be independent of the particular times and places at which those processes occur, unquote. This version conforms to the second horn, since Nagel insists the principle of causality is a, quote, maxim for inquiry rather than a statement with definite empirical content, unquote. Appealing as these approaches may be, they do not defeat the second horn of the dilemma. One could well imagine that a concept of causation might be indispensable, or an injunction to find causes, heuristically useful, if the conception of causation reflected some factual properties of the world. Then something like causation must arise when we conform our concepts to the world. Or a heuristic principle could exploit those facts to assist discovery. But that is the province of the first horn, where I have already described my reasons for doubting that there are such facts. The presumption of this second horn is that there are no such factual properties of the world. In the context of this second horn, conceptual indispensability or heuristic fertility must derive not from facts in the world, but from facts about us, our psychology, and our methods. So a supposed indispensability or fertility of the notion of causation is at most telling us something about us and does not establish that the world is governed at some fundamental level by a principle of causality. Varieties of Causal Skepticism The form of causal skepticism advocated here is not the more traditional humane and positivistic skepticism that is based on an austere epistemology and aversion to metaphysics. My anti-fundamentalism is based on an aversion to a priori science. It requires that a metaphysics of causation that pertains to the physical character of the world must be recovered from our science. It is worthwhile distinguishing a few varieties of causal skepticism in more detail. Humane slash positivist skepticism. This dominant tradition of causal skepticism in philosophical analysis depends upon an austere epistemology that denies we can infer two entities, causal or otherwise, beyond direct experience. What passes as causation is really just constant conjunction, or functional dependence within actual experiences. Hume, in 1777, initiated the tradition when he urged that the necessity of causal connection cannot be discerned in the appearances. The latter supply only constant conjunctions. The critique was sustained by the positivists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries as part of their program of eliminating metaphysics. Mach concluded, quote, There is no cause nor effect in nature. Nature has but an individual existence. Nature simply is. Unquote. Where Hume saw constant conjunction, Mach saw functional dependence. Quote, the concept of cause is replaced by the concept of function, the determining of the dependence of phenomena on one another the economic exposition of actual facts." Unquote. Very similar themes are found in Pearson. Russell also endorsed a functionalist view akin to Mach's. Anti-fundamentalism The skepticism of this paper is grounded in the content of our mature sciences and the history of their development. Skepticism about causal fundamentalism is derived from the failure of that content and history to support a stable factual notion of causation. Insofar as it is able to take the content of our mature sciences seriously, with that content extending well beyond direct experience, it relies on a fertile epistemology 
rather than the barren epistemology of Humean and positivist skepticism. I believe this anti-fundamentalist form of causal skepticism is quite broadly spread. What did the most to promote the view was the advent of quantum theory and the resulting demise of determinism. On the basis of the content of the latest science, a generation of physicists and philosophers of science lamented the failure of causation. However, I have found it hard to locate expositions in which that lament is systematically developed into a strongly argued version of anti-fundamentalism. It appears to be the position of Campbell. He noted that the relations expressed by many laws of nature cannot be causal since they do not conform to the characteristic properties of causal relations, which are temporal, asymmetric, and binary. So, he concluded, quote, Far from all laws asserting causal relations, it is doubtful whether any assert them." Unquote. These two forms of skepticism should be distinguished from eliminativism. In this view, causal skepticism is derived from the possibility of formulating our sciences without explicitly causal terms, like cause and effect. Bunge correctly protested that this is a simple verbal trap and not strong enough to support a robust skepticism. However, there is a converse trap. Most forms of causal skepticism, including mine, lead to the view that the notion of cause is dispensable. Mach, quote, hoped that the science of the future will discard the idea of cause and effect as being formally obscure, unquote. But that should not then be mistaken as the basis of their skepticism. This concludes Section 2 of Causation as Folk Science by John D. Norton. Stay tuned for Section 3.